Good morning, my friend. I hope you're doing well. It's going to be an amazing Friday out here on the river in Nebraska. And I don't know what you're doing today, but I pray that you have an amazing day. And I'm going to give you something today, a Friday conversation that I think will help you to have one of those great days because it'll open up the possibility that some of your future days may be better than the ones you've had in the past. This conversation on the surface looks like it's about alcohol. I'm going to talk to, we're going to have a conversation with somebody that I feel like is a new friend and certainly has been a guide for millions of people around the world who deal with relating to alcohol and and the difficulties that they have with changing their relationship to alcohol. Annie Grace is a woman in Colorado who, when she was 26 years old, was one of the youngest, was the youngest vice president in a multinational company's history. And she found that she went to all these dinners and business meetings and everywhere she went related to her job, there was alcohol involved. And by 35, she was a C-suite marketing VP and had a huge global responsibility for 28 countries for this company and ended up having so much sort of exposure to alcohol and so much stress and so much travel and all that, that that by the time she was 35, she was drinking two bottles of wine a night, many nights. And she found that it was just a price she couldn't pay anymore, that that it was costing her time and presence with her family. It was costing her days where she didn't feel good. It was costing her bad decisions, and she just didn't feel like she wanted to spend the rest of her life fighting through this daily battle for alcohol sobriety. And she found that alcohol wasn't serving her well, and she made this remarkable decision not to go to rehab or not to become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, not to even decide that she was an alcoholic because she, by many criteria, wasn't. And lots of people looked at her and said, you're not an alcoholic. Look how you're a global C-suite marketing level, C-suite level marketing executive. You're not an alcoholic. So she wondered, like, what does that mean? And she started looking into what alcohol actually does. What's the role that it plays in your life? And she decided to put that information research that she learned and she was shocked to find the amount of marketing and business that goes into the business of alcohol and how they convince people that it's going to do something for you besides get you drunk and make you pass out and crash your car <laughs> right all these commercials that seem to show alcohol associated with success or higher level of attractiveness to other people or being more interested or interesting or making more money that all these commercials that seem to show alcohol as this sort of secret ingredient in this in this good life and she said you know what i, I, I think there's some there's something that's not true about that. And she started researching and learning and she put that together in a PDF and wrote a blog about it ended up having 20 or 30,000 downloads of that PDF. And people started encouraging her to write a book and she self published the book, this naked mind, which is about learning how to control alcohol. And she now has sold over 1 million copies of that book that she self published. And she's been not having alcohol at all in her life for the past eight years. And she doesn't say that she's sober. She just says that she's made a decision not to drink. And the book is really incredible. Lisa and I ran across it because uh, Lisa found her on social media as someone we love. One of our family members was dealing with an alcohol issue. And Lisa got interested in trying to help this person. And she read this book, This Naked Mind, and and basically um, pointed it out to me that maybe it could be helpful because we have a lot of listeners and a lot of people that write in that talk about struggles with not just alcohol but but with um, substances and and habits and numbing behaviors of all different kinds and and people feel helpless they get they get to where they feel like they just can't control this thing this alcohol substances shopping sex pornography whatever it might be. And Annie's book, This Naked Mind, Control Alcohol, Find Freedom, Discover Happiness, and Change Your Life, is a book about specifically about alcohol. But I would submit to you that it's really about cognitive dissonance, about this, this idea in your mind that happens. It's, it's cognitive dissonance is defined as the sort of person who is holding two competing beliefs in their mind at the same time. It's an unpleasant psychological state that results from inconsistency between two or more elements in a cognitive system, according to the American Psychological Association. But according to the dictionary, it's just holding two conflicting beliefs at the same time. 
alcohol is bad for me. I'm drinking too much. It's hurting me. And at the same time, I really need it. I've had a stressful day. I deserve it. I, I, you know, this is going to make me feel better. It's going to help me sleep. It's whatever. You hold two beliefs at the same time. And until you can put the cards on the table and really understand what you think and feel and believe, then you can't really make any traction at getting better and making it better, whatever it is. And so this conversation, like I said, is really about alcohol, but I'm giving it to you not just because it's about alcohol, because many of my listeners don't have that particular problem. But most of us, I would submit, have something that we use in our lives to numb ourselves from the pain and the hardship and the circumstances and the difficulties and the stresses that we have. And it might be something that seems benign to you. It might be, you know, online gambling. It might be television. It might be reading the news, it might be shopping, it might be one-click Amazon purchases, whatever it is for you, it might be food, okay? It might be sex, it might be something like that. But whatever it is for you, as we've talked about numerous times before, if you're numbing yourself to the harsh realities of life with something, then you find that numbing is not selective. And you can't numb yourself from just that one thing, but you actually end up numbing yourself from your whole life. You can't experience the normal emotional highs and lows that give life its value and meaning. You can't fully be present and engaged with your family if you're numbing yourself. And the, and the next day you're paying that tomorrow tax. At least and I talk about where you made a decision tonight to turn your brain off and tomorrow you have a headache or you're not performing well or you forget something that you were supposed to do and you're, and you're paying a tax tomorrow for something you did today because you wanted to turn your brain off and be numb from it. And so... I could go down a, a number of paths with this with this conversation about alcohol, and I could give you a whole bunch of statistics about how bad and dangerous alcohol is. Well, guess what? If you are the kind of person who thinks that you don't have a problem with alcohol or with X, Y, or Z, whatever it is that you might be using to numb yourself, then you would hear these statistics, and you're going to go, wow, that's terrible. Those people can't control their behavior. And that's a problem that we have with alcohol. So we don't, we don't think that way about crack cocaine or methamphetamine. We would, most normal people would say, oh, I'd never use that drug. It's dangerous. It's a habit-forming drug. But we just give alcohol this pass. And Annie Grace gives us this understanding that the pass that we give alcohol really comes from a long line of marketing and advertising and psychological assault, basically, that's been done to us that makes us think that alcohol is in a separate class apart from other drugs and that it's really only a problem for certain people who don't know how to control it. And so I'm going to give you this interview with Annie Grace, and at the end, I'm going to come back and talk to you for a few minutes about several things. Annie Grace and I didn't get into any sort of spiritual conversation. I don't know her uh, on a personal level uh, enough to know how she feels about spiritual things at all, and this and her book doesn't delve into it really. And so th th this conversation doesn't take any sort of spiritual turn. I think that's important because I want you to understand that that before you can get to a spiritual place, you have to get to a cognitive place where you understand how you think and how you feel and the motivations and reasons behind why you do the things that you do. And that's when you can start being honest with yourself and start breaking down this cognitive dissonance and, and understanding you get your cards on the table and you understand what it is that you think that behavior is going to do for you and what it actually does to you and then you can start making better decisions and find freedom any grace's book is a tremendous resource for anybody who struggles with alcohol particularly but also with any type of substance or numbing behavior like we said what's it going to do for you my friend it's going to help you understand what alcohol is, what it does, how it's marketed. Here's what she had to say about that. So you have to sell not the product, the actual liquid, not what it does, the smell, but you have to sell what it then like can possibly create in your life. Right. And alcohol advertisers are brilliant at this. They tie alcohol to all of the deepest human needs and desires. Okay, so this conversation is kind of wide-ranging about the topic of alcohol and about psychology and cognitive dissonance and all those things. But it's going to help you specifically if you do have some guilt or shame or trouble with alcohol. If this sounds like you, if you're smart, driven, and in control of your life, but for some reason you have this exception around alcohol, like you can't control it as much as you want. If you're able to cut back or quit anytime you want, but when you do, you feel deprived and miserable because you're not 
drinking or if you find yourself drinking out of habit or boredom and then you regret it the next day, like, why did I do that? I didn't really need that. If you feel that way or you're tired of thinking about alcohol and while you might not want to be, quote, sober, you're ready for alcohol to be smaller and less relevant in your life, then Annie Grace's book, This Naked Mind, will help you. And this conversation will help you. Listen, we had a, we had a great talk. I'm very. It, it almost felt like we just stepped into the middle of a conversation between old friends. Like it just, we just kind of naturally related. Her conversation was was easy, and it was it was comfortable. And I asked Andy Grace at the end if she could just give us a few seconds of hope. Like if you're a person who feels hopeless around this issue or around anything really that you want to control in your life and you can't seem to be able to control it, like how do we find hope again? Here's what she said. What, what's your word of hope for our listener today that somebody that, that really wants to be able to break this chain and get free, and, and your book's really about freedom, uh, sure. which is a bridge to hope. So what, what's your word, your 30 seconds of, of hope for us as, as we're getting ready to wrap up today, Annie? So I think the most important thing is to have compassion for yourself. You know, you've been doing the best you can with the tools you have, and you've probably just had the wrong tools. You know, if you've been trying and failing, pretty sure you're using the tool called willpower, and yeah. that is the wrong tool. You know, compassion, a lot of knowledge. Knowledge will change your emotions around alcohol, and then making decisions, um, you're going to be much more successful. And so when we have the hope of like, Maybe I've just been using the wrong tool. I think that's such a, a great starting place, starting with a little bit of hope. I'm going to give you a little bit of hope today from Annie Grace. We had a really, really good conversation. It felt like I was talking to an old friend, probably because Lisa and I have read her book, and we appreciate her work so much. And it's been so helpful already to some people that we love and to some listeners and readers that we've passed it on to. We're going to give away two copies of the digital version of This Naked Mind. The first two people that email me, Lee at DrLeeWarren.com. Lisa and I are going to provide two copies of Annie's book to the first two listeners that email me, Lee at DrLeeWarren.com. Only digital copies. Uh, so just shoot me an email, lee at drleewarren.com if you would like that. Listen, friend, I'm always telling you, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And if you want to change your life big time as it relates to alcohol or any kind of numbing behavior, this Naked Mind approach from Annie Grace will help you. She's going to give you a little bit of hope today. And I'm going to come back at the end with just a few more thoughts to kind of wrap it up and, and give you a couple of spiritual insights I think that will be helpful too. I'm really excited to bring you this guest today. This is one of my favorite Friday conversations so far, and I know it's going to help you. You can't change your life until you change your mind, friend. This one's going to make a difference for you. And Lisa, as always, is going to give us the good news that we can start today. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. That place is called self-brain surgery. You can learn it and it will help you become healthier, feel better, and be happier. And the good news is you can start today. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, so glad to have you listening today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I live in Nebraska in the United States of America with my incredible wife, Lisa, my father-in-law, Tata, and the super pups, Harvey and Lewis. I'm a neurosurgeon and an author, and I'm here to help you harness neuroscience, the power of your brain, faith, the power of your spirit, and good old common sense to help you lead a healthier, better, happier life. Listen, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind, and I'm here to help you learn the art of self-brain surgery to get it done if you like the show. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode and tell your friends about it. If you tell two or three friends this podcast was helpful to you, imagine how much good we can all do around the world together. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm here to help you change your mind so you can change your life. Let's get after it. Well, friend, we're back, and I'm so excited uh, to have a new friend here. Annie Grace is with us from This Naked Mind. Hi, Annie. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm really well. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Yeah, happy to be here. You're out in beautiful Colorado. Yeah, nice and snowy here today. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Hey, tell us tell us a little bit about your story. I'm gonna I've already told my listeners who you are and, and a little bit about your book and and all that, but tell us tell us your story and how you came to be such an influential person in this topic of alcohol. Yeah, it was I like to call it it was almost like becoming an accidental author. Um, really what happened was I, I didn't even drink much in high school or college. And I went away, um, to, I, we moved to New York city right after my husband and I, we got married, we moved to New York city basically simultaneously. And 
I was in New York and, you know, not really going out to happy hour. And fascinating situation was that my boss actually came up to me one day and said, Hey, like, why don't, why don't you come out? And I was like, Oh, I don't really drink. And he's like, Oh, no, no, no. It's not, it's not really about the drinking. And I was, you know, 20, 26 years old. And he's like, no, this is where the deals get done. This is how um, you get your ideas showcased, you know, whenever all, right. all the executives, all this stuff. So I was like, all right. And um, ended up just going out to happy hour. I had a little method because I was like, okay, I want to do this for my career. I grew up without any sort of cautionary tale around alcohol. So right. drink a glass of wine and a glass of water. And, you know, in a nutshell, fast forward a decade and drinking at work became drinking at home. And I found myself mother of two now had been promoted multiple times, was in charge of, um, in charge of all of marketing for the entire globe for this company, 28 countries flying all around the world and drinking pretty much two bottles of wine every single night. Oh my. That'll, uh, that'll put a damper on your life outside of working and drinking, doesn't it? Yeah. And it was really interesting. I mean, I had such a high tolerance that especially when I stopped drinking, people were like, huh, I didn't even realize you were drinking that much. And, right. and I think that's one of the interesting things about, um, about alcohol is that it does, it can create such a high tolerance. And yeah. for me, so I reached this point in my life where I was like, okay, this is, this is not making me feel good. You know, I'm, I, I'm sure this can't be healthy for me. I've been pretty health conscious in my life. And I was like, okay, like, I just want to, I want to just cut back. No big deal. Right. And the reality of, of that was that on one hand, it was no big deal. I could physically stop drinking and, you know, take breaks and drink less, but emotionally, I had come to believe that alcohol was really kind of the duct tape that was holding my whole life together. I believe that it was right. fun and relaxing and all these sorts of things. And so when I would take a break or stop drinking, I'd find myself feeling deprived and like I was missing out. And so I, I just go back to it over a period of time. And that kind of started this very circular experience of, you know, all right, going to not drink and then drinking and then not going to drink. And it was interesting before I really became conscious of trying to drink less on a regular basis, it was, uh, felt like a relative non-issue in my life. Certainly there was aspects of, you know, worry about my health and whatnot, but it was not that big of a thing. It wasn't until I was really actively trying to control it that it became big. And I would say big, like in my mind, um, when am I going to drink? When am I not going to drink? How much is enough? How much is not enough? And that kind of, you know, turned into this period of time that was pretty miserable for me. Um, and in that journey, I had a friend who went to AA and she kind of said, you know, this is what I'm doing. I was like, Oh, really? Well, you know, should I, should I come with you? And she's like, Oh no, no, you're not an alcoholic. Yeah, I was born this way. And uh, I learned that. And so I was like, huh, interesting. And um, it was one of those moments where I was like, okay, well, I guess, I guess that's good. But also, and, and of course there's no true definition in that situation. Like I didn't right. ask what exactly does that mean? Just, you know, but I assume there's authority there and people would know. Uh, and so I was like, all right, well, I guess that's good, but also it didn't really leave me any good avenues, um, to get my own drinking under control. And so a few years into this cycle of stopping and starting and feeling, you know, really losing trust and faith in my own ability to do the right thing, because I'd find myself doing behaviors that I just didn't want to do. I had this experience where I realized that, you know, I've, I've been asking these questions, which are, what's wrong with me? Am I an alcoholic? And these really terrifying questions to which there's a huge barrier to saying yes to either of those, you know, to saying, yes, I have a problem or, or yes, there's something wrong with me, or yes, I'm an alcoholic. Like there's just this psychological barrier. You don't want to believe any of that about yourself. Um, And so really putting off the conversation for as long as possible. And I remember coming back, I was actually in Heathrow Airport, coming back from the UK from a business trip. And we'd had a super boozy week. And I remember sitting in the airport and thinking, you know what? Like, I wonder why. Why is it that I used to be able to 
not drink at all or barely drink and take it or leave it? And why is it now such a thing? Like, why does it take up so much space in my mind? Like what, what is happening here? And I did something which I didn't really realize was radical at the time, but I now do is I I decided I was going to stop trying to stop drinking. I was going to just stop the cycle of trying and failing and, you know, all of the emotional baggage that comes with that. And I was just going to find out why I was just going to learn why. And we live in this beautiful day and age where you can pay 50 bucks for pretty much any study that's been done. Right. You're not, you know, in a university. And so I just started researching why. And at the same time, really made, you know, me stopping trying to stop was a, an act of self-compassion. It was letting myself off the hook saying, hey, you know, you're doing the best you can with the tools you have and alcohol is your tool right now. So you need it. You feel like you need it. You perceive that you need it. Go ahead. Let's just find out why at the same time. And that journey took me about a year. I walked out of my office one day, uh, home office, and told my husband, you know, if you want to drink with me anymore, tonight's the night because I don't think I'm going to drink after this. And he was so surprised and like, okay, didn't really believe me if I'm honest. And we got drunk that night and that was um, about eight years ago now. And I just, you know, and I don't, I don't claim to be sober. I don't claim to be in recovery. I just say, you know, I have drank as much as I want whenever I wanted over the last eight years. And the truth is I, I just really haven't wanted to drink and it's been um, really cool. And, and I think from there I had been uh, keeping track of all of this stuff I'd been learning. So I just felt very compelled that other people needed to know and hear this. I remember the the research process feeling like, what? Oh my gosh, how do we not know this? How do we not see this? How is this not, you know, something we're talking about? And I over and over just being so shocked by our lack of collective knowledge and awareness about the subject of alcohol. And, um, and so I took all of those journals and I just put them out online in a PDF and uh, 20,000 people downloaded them in the first two weeks. Wow! And it started just like spreading all over through all sorts of different groups and, and I, I started getting emails from all over the world. I'd put my email address in there and people saying, Hey, like this helped me when nothing else has, this is amazing. And I actually got an email from one man and he was like, you, you need to make this a book. And yeah. I was like, well, how do I, I don't know how to do that. You know? And he said, well, you can actually self-publish these days. You can actually put something on Amazon yourself. And so I looked into that and and realized, yes, that was true. And I figured out how to self-publish. And so I self-published my my book, This Naked Mind, my first book in 20, oh gosh, 2015, I believe is when it came out. And and it has since sold over a million copies. And so it's been a ride. Yeah, really cool. You you have an approach that I think is really unique. And and I'd like to get into that a little bit as you, you... you don't come at it from, you know, this this idea of it's going to hurt you or it's it's immoral or any of these other things that, that we use so so often to try to control behavior, but you 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 pointed out this idea of cognitive dissonance, like you, you're not going to get rid of something until you decide that you don't need it anymore, until you stop having this belief that you need it in some way that it's going to do something for you. So, so talk about that a little bit. Like you, I think, I think is that's the most brilliant point. I think that, that I got from your work is this quit trying to use willpower and quit trying to use, you know, whatever else it is that you've tried before and and start just dealing with the psychological things that you're telling yourself. You're not having to make a decision one way or the other. I, I love that thought process. Yeah, it, there's so many aspects of like how the brain works that I I didn't even realize or understand at the time and I've since you know really kind of tried to figure out well why exactly did this work so well. Um but as I was as I was experiencing my own journey that cognitive dissonance that pain of believing two contradictory things at the same time yep. was really painful. And I would believe things like alcohol is the key to surviving um, motherhood, right? Yeah. And it, it is what I need right now to have these, be a working mom with two little kids. It's how I'm holding it all together. And I believe that, like, I believe this guy was blue. Like, it was for sure my best friend. And 
alcohol was also simultaneously making me rush through bedtime because I was trying to get, you know, downstairs to have another glass of wine. And yeah. so it was robbing me. And so I, I would see these two realities and have all of this internal, internal strife and internal pain. And then I would see myself, you know, experience like, okay, I'm ne- the middle of the night wake up where I'm like, okay, never again. I feel terrible. That was awful. And then by 5 p.m. the next day, wake up and feel like an entirely different human being, not even remembering or giving any credence to that. Oh, well, whatever. That was just last night. No, no problem. Tonight, tonight I won't overdo it. And, you know, then the cycle would repeat itself. And so I was thinking about this one day and I was realizing that, you know, even if we see conflict across the street where we see strangers fighting with each witnessing it in a television show to some degree, we have a bodily response to that. We feel that emotion. We feel that discomfort. And I mean, even more so uh, if it's in our house or with people we love, right? We feel so much more discomfort in conflict, but we discount the incredible amount of discomfort that is inside of us when it comes to doing any habit, whether it's alcohol, smoking, doom scrolling on social media, eating, you know, what we don't want to be eating, anything we want to be doing and we're not doing, or we don't want to be doing and we are doing, and then we beat ourselves up with all that guilt and shame and willpower. That cycle of conflict is one of the most painful things I've experienced, but we are so used to that. We're so used to this inner dialogue of, you know, just nastiness against ourselves that it's almost like we don't realize that it's happening until it's like a drum set that you've just gotten used to. And then until somebody stops playing the drums, you didn't even realize it was noisy. And I think that that pain is in a part really responsible for um, continued drinking well beyond when it logically makes sense is because you've been sort of conditioned based on your own experience and society to believe that alcohol is the thing you do when you're in pain. That's how you self-medicate. That's how you escape. And so you're, you're creating this pain. Then that pain is yeah. you know causing you to drink more and the cycle is just perpetuating. And I think seeing that cycle really clearly for me and being like, okay, well, what, what then is the answer? What then is the way out of that cycle? Because I, once I could see how incredibly painful that was, um, I was really motivated to try to find a way out. Oh, brilliant. I have this memory when I was a resident um, being in the operating room with a professor and we're, we're standing there doing brain surgery on somebody. So we got the human brain exposed, right? And and the scrub tech makes a mistake and brings up some uh, alcohol soaked sponges onto the field. And the attending freaks out on her, like you can't have alcohol in the field. It's a direct neurotoxin. It can't get on the brain. It'll tear. You know, it kills cells directly. You cannot have alcohol in the brain. And then we go to dinner that night with a visiting professor, and everybody gets plowed, right? So you have <laughs> you have these neurosurgeons who know that alcohol will kill your brain cells and then they're drinking alcohol. So that, that's, that's a great example of this cognitive. We, we think we need it socially. We think it makes us better conversationalists. We, you know, we think it makes us more attractive or funnier or whatever. And yet we know it's going to destroy our neurons. That's a, that's my favorite example of that. What an incredible story. Oh my gosh. I'm going to steal that story. Steal it. It's all yours. But man, yeah, you can reference Dr. Warren. (laughs) I think the other thing that I love about your book is, and, and we're going to, we're at least and I are going to give a couple of copies away to the first two listeners that write in. You can email me at lee at drleewarren.com. We'll send you, Lisa and I will give to you a copy of Annie's book. Um, Cause I think it's important. It's going to help some people, but you write with such compassion and you break down some myths for us that you know everybody thinks at least our society has done such a good job of marketing to us Oh, before I say that, talk about the marketing for a second, because that's something I hadn't really thought about. Alcohol has an incredible marketing team. And, and, and just, just cover that for a second. Yeah, it, it really does. And it, I have um, deep experience in marketing because it was my career before I became an accidental author. And I remember le- learning a framework called the products, products, product, and it was how to sell anything. And it was like, okay, if you if you have a perfume advertisement and you put on the poster, it smells great, you're not going to sell anything because you're selling, you know, like that's not actually why people buy perfume. And yeah. then if you say, well, what is it exactly? Well, it's a yellow liquid in a bottle that smells great. You're still probably not going to sell anything. But if you put like, 
a human need, like, you know, you put attractive people or yeah. people on a date or sex, like those things are going to sell. Right. Yeah. And that's really fascinating. So you have to sell, not the product, the actual liquid, not what it does, the smell, but you have to sell what it then like can possibly create in your life. Right. And alcohol advertisers are brilliant at this. They tie alcohol to all of the deepest human needs and desires, you know, the desire to not be alone, to be part of a tribe, to be accepted, to be fun. They, yeah. um, there's so many different to be unique. So everybody has kind of their brand or their flavor, you know, are you a craft beer drinker? Are you a whiskey drinker? And so there's, there's all of these sub identities tied into it. And and it's all very intentional. They have, I mean, and even I marketed pretty boring things like financial products. And even there, we would have psychologists in the room and human behavior yeah. specialists. And I mean, all the more so I've spoken to a few people who have been on advertising teams for alcohol and, and they very intentionally sit around. I remember reading an article about a conversation that happened at um, one of their conventions about the demographic of women being underserved because women were not drinking yeah. as much as men. And so they created an entire branding campaign across many brands for uh, women targeted alcohol. And, you know, now you see it everywhere. You see these low, low carb, low cal, um, different seltzers that are fruit flavored. You've got yep. wine that's mommy's time out, or, you know, like all of these different, like really marketing at that mommy wine culture, which was, you know, in a big part created by the alcohol industry. And so it is fascinating, these decisions that we feel, and this is advertising just in general, but these decisions that we feel we, we're making really independently um, actually are, are, are very heavily influenced by some of these, some of these very, very scary, smart, uh, but also in this case, radically dangerous marketing in initiatives. That's right. You're, we've we've been given this societal sort of blank check to that this is a product that we need. It'll make us. You talked about that. Like it makes us smarter. It makes us funnier. It makes us more likely to be successful romantically. It makes us you know richer or whatever. And the truth is, if you look at it across the board, like alcohol doesn't actually do any of those things. It, it doesn't make us smarter. It doesn't make us wealthier. It doesn't make us more successful or more interesting or funnier. It doesn't make us live longer. I remember in medical school that JAMA, when I was in med school is when that JAMA article came out that showed the the famous sort of J-shaped curve with cardiovascular benefit where so for a few years, even doctors were saying, yeah, there's a little benefit, you know, a little bit better heart lifestyle if you drink a little bit every night and not too much but a little bit's good for you and now we know that's not even true like so talk about the health just the health aspect that you that you learned from your research yeah and it's it's really it's really unfortunate because these articles i mean first of all you really have to dig under the surface to understand where the funding came from and sometimes yeah. you can figure it out and sometimes you can't but often you know i've spoken to scientists whose articles have been misused in a way and yeah, I guess the headline technically is true, but actually the science was never meant to, to be that way. So for example, there was this huge study that came out about alcohol making you live longer. Um, yeah. And they, they were comparing, uh, actually, I'll give you a different one that was more recent. There's a recent study that came out that said, you know, alcohol, um, moderate alcohol intake is associated with decreased risk in diabetes. And right. if you read through that study, they only studied people who are heavily drinking versus people who are um, people who are drinking with food versus people who are drinking while not eating. So they didn't study the correlation of diabetes and people who are not drinking at all. So the article is if you eat with like if you drink with your meal, you will decrease your risk of diabetes. That's technically true, right? <laughs> if you drink with your meal instead of drink drinking by meal. itself, <laughs> but they did not, nothing in the study compared just not drinking and that. Right. Right. And so it's, it's so unfortunate how it gets so misconstrued. And, you know, alcohol was declared a carcinogen in 1988. That is something that if you walk down the street and just ask people, does alcohol cause cancer? Most people don't know that that's true. That was yeah. a very long time ago that that was true. But these things get, you know, very buried. And then the the kind of 
sensational studies like that diabetes one get shared all the time because yeah. again, another, another, um, similar to cognitive dissonance, we have this confirmation bias, right? This yeah. other aspect of the brain where we want to prove that what we're doing is okay. And so if we feel uncomfortable with our drinking, we're going to look for things that actually make us feel better and make us feel like, oh, it's no big deal. So for a long time, and this is still true to some extent, but I remember when they first came out on the market, there was all these placards that were for sale at every single home goods store or Walmart. And it would be saying things like, I drink every day that doesn't end with a Tuesday or no good story started with a salad. That's why I love wine. And all of these like just right. pro drinking things that you put in your kitchen. And it would help somebody to just feel better in the moment. But you have to ask yourself, like, where did that stuff originate, right? Like, <laughs> who's the master yeah. behind all of these all of these sorts of things? And then the most interesting study came out actually in 2020. And it was a meta study on all sorts of other studies. from, And it was conducted by the World Health Organization. And they concluded that no amount of alcohol is safe. Not not one drink or two drinks. You know the whole heart health that had been debunked a while ago. Um, but like this study studied all the studies, and they said no amount of alcohol is safe. And right. um, of course, that's not really it's not one that anybody's sharing because then you're Debbie Downer and you're you know <laughs> yeah. you're you're missing out on the party and all that sort of stuff. So it's it's just it's just fascinating how we we really do give it a free pass. In fact. We talk about it, you know, alcohol and drugs rather than alcohol being a drug. Exactly. And up until the recent fentanyl crisis, alcohol was the leading cause of like death. Like it was killing more people than all prescription and illegal drugs combined until very recently. And it, it's not that alcohol deaths have gone down. It's just that this opioid crisis has, has surpassed it tragically. Yeah, and that's true. And it, it all of us physicians and medical people who deal with trauma, like it reigns supreme as a contributing factor in every type of trauma, every type of accident. You know, it, everything's in everything's related to alcohol. Like, it, you, if you find a person who falls off a ladder at two a.m. and they're not out al drinking alcohol, you test their blood again and make sure they're telling you the truth. Like everybody, it's 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 almost almost universal that trauma is related to alcohol. So I, I I wanted to bring that up just to say, like, we have so much societal pressure to that the alcohol is not a drug and it's not for gutter drunks and it's not for bad people. It's for normal people that we create this idea. And you talk about it brilliantly that the people who have a problem, the people who end up in rehab or end up in the gutter are just sort of genetically faded almost to be that way. And and so so how do we decide who's addicted or who's an alcoholic and who's not? And why is that such a myth? Like you talk really well about that. Like everybody has the potential to become, everybody does become tolerant to alcohol as they use it more. So talk about addiction and, and, and that sort of thing for a moment, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. And I think this is, um, it's just such a tragic aspect. And it's one of the things during my research that I kept looking at being like, how do we not know this? How do we not see this? Because I was also under this myth that if you can either drink normally, you're quote a normal drinker, or you're an alcoholic and you don't actually need to worry. I mean, and, and it was even confirmed for me by that woman who was a friend of mine who went to AA saying, no, you don't have to worry. You're not an alcoholic. And it was, it's so pervasive in our society that it's this us or them. And if you're not one of them, no big deal. You're totally fine. You can drink normally. In fact, if you look at the only disclaimer that we have on alcohol, despite it being so responsible for deaths, and you have to imagine that there's so much lobbyist and, and money involved in, in how this got allowed, but the only disclaimer we have is to drink responsibly, which right. if you unpack that by itself, it puts all of the blame on the human being, right? Like if you right. human being cannot consume a known addictive toxic substance responsibly, then you are the problem. And alcohol is not the problem. It really gives alcohol this free pass. That's right. And this whole idea that there's, you know, quote, alcoholics. And it's fascinating. Like certainly there are lots of factors in why one human might become more um, addicted to a certain substance and another human. I mean, and, and you know this, I'm sure far better than I do, but be, between what 
what uh, you know deficiency in certain neurotransmitters we might have. We might be mm-hmm. more interested in sugar or more interested in alcohol. And, and so there's all sorts of different factors, but the reality is when they've done studies on, um, on mice, if they expose them to the processes in the brain that happen that create addiction, like a hundred percent get addicted when they're force fed it. Yeah. It's, it's not this only a few people, right? Only, only these certain people who might have these predispositions and, and this myth has just perpetuated and a lot of it is because we can't explain, well, why do some people fall faster than other people? There were some really interesting studies that were done um, about a decade ago about uh, tracing trauma to alcohol. So if you yeah. were drinking for self-medication, you would be at risk to become addicted faster or out of control in your relationship with alcohol faster. But the reality is, is even if you're not, quote, addicted According to the CDC's website, only 10% of excessive drinkers are addicted to alcohol. But all of those problems that you're talking about, whether it's in the ER or I have a friend who's a fireman and he says 80 to 90% of his calls are alcohol related, um, you know, it's indicated in 75% of suicides, like all of these problems, they're not coming from that that fraction. They're coming from all of us. They're coming from That's all right. of all of us who are drinking excessively. And so to delineate, it just, it, it creates so many problems. It creates this us and them mentality. It creates this false sense of security. If we feel like we are not um, one of them, then we get to just carry on drinking. It it creates shame and a huge barrier to entry. I mean, they say like, oh, well, first step is admitting that you're an alcoholic. If that's the first step, I'll tell you 90% of people coming toward that first step are never going to make that step because that step is, you might as well have that step. If you imagine like a, a, a physical step is four inches tall and that's the first step, this step of admitting that I'm an alcoholic and the implications of what that mean. Not only do I think about my friends and my social life, I have to take on a label. I might have to go to rehab. I have to go to meetings, all of this stuff. It's not a four inch step. It's a, it's a 10 foot step, right? Yeah. And so we have to climb over that wall to actually come to what quote the first step is, which is admitting a problem. And I, I just think all of that is so useless. If we could just have a better question and a better set of questions, which are very simple, Am I drinking more than makes me feel good? Am I drinking more than I want to? Forget the label, forget the blame, forget the shame. Just ask yourself and don't let that mean anything tragic or, you know, disease focused or anything. Just just decide like, am I eating more sugar than I want to? Great. Okay. Then I'm going to look at that. Right. But it's, it's this false idea of only certain people become addicted that I think is, and, and those people are, are alcoholics and everybody else is fine. Um, yeah. It's really doing us a disservice. I, I think that's right. And there's this this uh, statement that you've made, and my friend Daniel Amos said it a bunch of times and written about it, where alcohol is like the only drug that we get peer pressure to keep using or, or to not avoid using. Like it, it's we get peer pressure by people to use the drug, and we would never, nobody would ever say, "Hey, why aren't you snorting coke with us tonight? Like normal people don't have that conversation, right? It's like, what's wrong with you? Why do you, do you have a problem? Why are you not drinking alcohol tonight? Right. And this is water, by the way. I'm drinking. <laughs> so I have um, a couple more things for you. I promised you about 30 minutes. We're getting close to that. So I want to respect your time, but you, you talk in your book about your dad, who was one of these rare people who just made a decision and quit drinking and, and never drank again. We have a, a cousin who has been on the podcast and talked about how he was drinking a bottle of vodka every day before he went to work and then he would work and then he would go drink another bottle of vodka and go play golf every day. And then he just quit. He just stopped and he hasn't had a drink in two years. And th- there's a unique personality type that's able to do that. And your dad was one of them. So. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's so fascinating. I was trying to unpack like, why, why does this happen? It's called spontaneous sobriety. It's been well yeah. studied and actually it is interestingly more effective than any treatment in terms yeah. of long-term sobriety. It's the most effective thing. So the question is, well, how do you get there? And I think that the reality is that if you are back and forth in that place of cognitive dissonance, should I, shouldn't I, That creates pain. And then as drinkers, we say, okay, for pain, we drink as we've kind of covered already. But if you get to a place where you are just a hundred percent, like that's a no, you make one decision to rule them all. 
you're not allowing the possibility. And so it takes a lot to get to that point of decision for sure. Like there's, there's a lot of, of, of precursors to that. For me, it was this incredible amount of research of really understanding what alcohol is or does for other people. It might just be life experiences that you're unwilling to tolerate anymore. Um, That's really what it was for my dad. He was just like, no, I want to be healthier than this. This isn't serving me anymore. But once you change that, once you shift that, you move yourself out of um, constant decisions. And, and it's fascinating because if we, if we look at willpower and all the, you know, most recent science tells us that willpower functions more like a muscle, meaning you can have less or more of it at any given time. And if you've used your willpower to overcome, you know, maybe <laughs> paying attention during a boring work meeting, and then you try to use that same reserve of willpower to not drink, you're going to be less successful. Right. That's right. And so there is a phenomenon called decision-making fatigue, which basically just means all decisions, whether big or small, they carry a mental load. They carry this cognitive load where you have to um, actually exert energy to make decisions. And then when you're exerting energy, you have less energy to use for other decisions. So if you have left the door open, I'm going to try to drink less. I'm going to try to moderate. I'm going to see how this goes. What you're doing is you're inviting infinite decisions. When is it a good time? How much? How little? Did I do too much? Is it okay now? What should I drink? How can I maintain this? And you've created this very noisy, very exhausting place in your mind that is is tiring. And, And that tiredness, that exhaustion, that mental exhaustion actually makes you more susceptible to drinking. So if you get to this point where you are just, and whatever it takes for you to get there, lots of different things, you know, whether I believe that knowledge is the first step, learning everything you can, unpacking the beliefs you have around, is it really, like you were saying earlier, it doesn't do it neurochemically. It does none of the stuff we believe alcohol does, none of it. And so if you learn all of that, you can be in a much better place to make that finite, like once decision. Um, Other people, like I said, life experience. But once you make that decision, you've eliminated all the small decisions. And it's just this place of incredible freedom. And I think it comes from, but you have to be, you know, really unswayed by other people's opinions. Because I think that is one of the things that, that gets people. They're like, yes, never again until until happy hour. And then somebody, Oh, come on just this one time. It's not that bad. And all of a sudden. So I think the type of person is a very independent thinker, um, that, that really just, you know, has decided for themselves, like what they want to do. Yeah, that's right. So people who are listening today, some of them might be in that kind of hopeless place that you talk about where, where they've tried it so many times and they, and they, and they just, they just don't believe that it can be better for them. Like what, what's your word of hope for our listener today? That somebody that, that really wants to be able to break this chain and get free and, and your book's really about freedom, uh, yeah. which is a bridge to hope. So what, what's your word, your 30 seconds of, of hope for us as, as we're getting ready to wrap up today, Annie? So I think the most important thing is to have compassion for yourself. You know, you've been doing the best you can with the tools you have and you've probably just had the wrong tools, you know, if you've been trying and failing, pretty sure you're using the tool called willpower. And that is the wrong tool. You know, compassion, a lot of knowledge, knowledge will change your emotions around alcohol and then making decisions. um, You're going to be much more successful. And so when we have the hope of like, maybe I've just been using the wrong tool. I think that's such a a great starting place, starting with a little bit of hope and, and just compassion, you know, like, of course it's been hard. You haven't had the right, right equipment. Of course it's been hard. We liken it sometimes yeah. like it's, it's like you're trying to cut down a tree with a spoon. Like that is literally what it's like to try to just force yourself to stop drinking when you believe it is the most important thing in your life. And so you just need a different set of tools. What's your life like now? So you're eight years into this journey and, and you're helping other people, not just with alcohol, but tell us about your world now, like what, what your life is like now. It's so much, it's, it's so much like when I was really young, um, in, in the way of like, just this morning, my son said something so silly and I was just laughing until I was crying and it just struck (laughs) me because I'm just present in the moment. And it was for so long, I'd been so wrapped up in my own mind, you know, should I drink? Shouldn't I drink? Or the, the stress of it all, the heaviness of life and life 
it doesn't actually have to be that heavy, but we really increase the heaviness when we add this burden, this physical burden of drinking, this mental and emotional burden of doing something that we don't want to be doing and judging ourselves for it. Yep. And so I, I guess if I had to describe it in a few words, I would just say like light and free and, and really joyful. And that is very reminiscent of, of when I was a child, like just kind of living without the heaviness. Um, and it's funny, we, we think it gets hard to be an adult and then we start drinking to deal with the hard, but drinking just really compounds the hard. And, and when you stop self-medicating, you have to do this radical thing, which is you have to actually address all those things you were self-medicating in the beginning. <laughs> and that's some work. It's some lifetime work of unpacking, you know, the things that are hard in your life, but you can actually solve them. You can actually find better habits and routines that support really, really happy, healthy living. And when you solve those things, then, you know, it just gets really fun on the other side. That's amazing. Friend, you're always hearing me say it. You know, we know from functional neuroimaging, you can actually change your brain chemistry by changing how you think. And I always tell people you can't change your life until you change your mind. Like you got to change how you think about stuff. And one big thing that you've helped me and and uh, I'm hoping that we'll help these listeners think about is just just change how you think about alcohol, how you relate to it. And you can break that cognitive dissonance and you can set yourself free like Annie did. Annie, I'm so grateful that you've spent half an hour here with us today and uh, hope to introduce a few thousand more people to your work and and um, and I just appreciate what you're doing. You came at it from a different direction uh, than a lot of people have and, and you're, you're setting people free. So good job. Thank you for, for your time today. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Warren. It's been awesome. What a great conversation. Listen, friend, this episode was not played to get you to never have a, a sip of alcohol again. Okay. It's not my point in doing this. If alcohol is not your thing, if alcohol is not your problem, or if alcohol is your thing or is your problem, I brought the episode to you for the same reason. I want you to understand the power and impact of cognitive dissonance in your decision making and in the things that you do and the ways in which cognitive dissonance can put you in jail and prison in your own life. There's this weird scripture it's not really weird, but there's this obscure scripture, First Kings eighteen twenty one, where the prophet Elijah is come it comes to the people. He, he says, Elijah came near to all the people and said, "How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is your God, follow him. If Baal is your God, then follow him." And the people did not answer him a word. How long will you go limping, friend, between two different opinions? Here's that, that's really the point of this whole conversation is the problem we have with alcohol and the problem we have with any numbing behavior is that we want to stay in two camps. We want to be people who think we're in control of our decisions and in control of our own lives and we're, and we're doing good things. And at the same time, we feel powerless to handle this one thing. We can't stop using it to, co to continually go back to the well of covering our stress and our emotions and our fatigue and our worry and our shame and our guilt with this particular behavior, whether it be alcohol or whatever else. Now, from a spiritual standpoint, I want you to be aware that the, the secret to getting rid of cognitive dissonance is to get the truth out on the table. Jesus said it plain in John, the truth will set you free. Okay, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So how you handle cognitive dissonance, as Annie said, research it, understand it, know what it is that's being marketed to you, know, understand the psychology of what's happening in your own brain, and make a decision that's based on the truth, Okay. And you only have to make one decision and not thousands of them. And you have to take willpower. You can take willpower out of the equation completely, okay? But so in, as it relates to alcohol, for example, know the truth. If you're a person who was raised in an evangelical or fundamentalist tradition like I was, you find out to your surprise when you grow up that some of the things you were told about what the Bible says about alcohol aren't actually true. Like the, the idea that you're going to burn in hell if you put your hand on a can of beer. That's not true. The Bible, multiple places, tells us explicitly that God created alcohol. The Psalm says he made wine to gladden the hearts of man. Like, and there's a verse in the New Testament where Paul tells Timothy, have a little wine for your stomach. Back then the water was bad and people had trouble. And so they drank some, they put some alcohol in their system to help their digestive problems right so there are some there is some scripture that does not expressively expressly prohibit the use of alcohol so if you grow up thinking that and then you find it it creates this sort of this sort of rift in between what you were taught and what you see with your own eyes and that sometimes in some people produces this idea to explore and run rampant and one of my relatives died as an alcoholic and he told me late in his life 
my father's religion ruined my life. It made me want to pursue things that I was told I couldn't, and I found you know, examples of things in the Bible and other people who were good people that were doing these things, and I pursued them vigorously, and my father's religion ruined my life. So I'm telling you that to say this, friend. Like, know the truth, okay? Don't make decisions about alcohol because some preacher told you you were going to burn in hell if you touched it. And don't make decisions about alcohol because some marketer tells you that you're going to be more successful romantically or more financially successful or you're going to win the Super Bowl or something if you drink a beer, right? Don't don't make decisions based on other people's false information, okay? Make decisions because you understand the truth, and once you understand the truth and you make a decision for yourself and not rely on willpower, which is a terrible thing to help you make any kind of success in your life. Willpower just isn't a great opportunity for you to be successful with anything. It's fatigable and it fails and it's not a good tool. It's like Annie said, it's trying to chop down a tree with a spoon. Willpower is not the thing. So I wanted to give you this conversation today just to help you get the truth out on the table. Annie Grace is a tremendous resource. If you particularly struggle with addiction or with just a bad relationship with alcohol or nicotine or anything, Annie Grace's website, thisnakedmind.com, will help you. Lisa and I, as I said before, are going to give away two digital copies of Annie's book, Lee at DrLeeWarren.com is the email address. If you want a copy of her book digitally, we're going to send two digital copies, no print copies, but two digital copies of that book. Let me know if you'd like it. First two listeners, I'll send it to you. But listen, her website has a tremendous community. It's got resources. It's got just great help for you if you're struggling. I want you to break the chain of dependency. I want you to break the chain of feeling like you have to numb yourself. I want you to break the chain of alcohol's power over your life. And if it's not alcohol for you, whatever it is, I want you to break the chain. I want you to know the truth because the truth will set you free. I'm always telling you, you can't change your life until you change your mind. Andy Grace will help you do that. And the good news is, my friend, you can start today. Hey, thanks for listening. Please subscribe to the show so you automatically get every episode. And if you like the show, you'll love my weekly letter. Check out my writing at drleewarren.substack.com, drleewarren.substack.com. Get the free newsletter every week for my best prescriptions for becoming healthier, feeling better, and being happier through the power of faith and neuroscience smashing together via self-brain surgery, drleewarren.substack.com. And if you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at wleewarnmd.com slash prayer. The theme music for the show is Make Us One by Tommy Walker, graciously provided for free by the great folks over at tommywalkerministries.org. Check it out and consider supporting them, tommywalkerministries.org. Remember, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you soon. God bless you, friend. Have a great day.